Put the PowerPoint up here. Okay, there we go. Uh, there we go. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And thank you for this opportunity to once again address the members of the Sport Literature Association. Today, I'm delighted to share with you my engagement with what might be the most significant work of sport literature to appear in the last five years, The Wolves by Sarah DeLapp. My presentation will explore how staging and studying the play provides a unique case study that reveals core thematic concerns at the intersections of sport, literature, pedagogy, and performance. As Richard Oman has traced the processes of canon formation for US, uh, contemporary US fiction from 1960 to 75, Sarah DeLapp's play is an excellent example of how a new play can still score big with contemporary audiences. Acing the Bechdel test with an all-female cast of 10, the play depicts an elite suburban indoor soccer team of nine 16 and 17 year old girls plus one soccer mom. The play features overlapping dialogue in the style refined by Carol Churchill, uh, beginning with her work with Max Stafford Clark and the Joint Stock Company at London's Royal Court in the late 1970s. But with the added dimension of sport, the challenge of speech while being physically active as the players warm up in each of the six scenes, which correspond with weekly Saturday games the team plays over a winter, the soccer mom appearing with a monologue at the end of the play at a domed sportsplex. Then a 20 something MFA student at Brooklyn College, Sarah DeLapp's play was selected by blind jury from among 578 submissions as one of five main stage staged readings for the May 2015 Great Plains Theater Conference in Omaha, Nebraska, kicking off the annual Festival of New Writing at 10 a.m. that May 28th. Under the direction of Lila Neugebauer, Play Playwrights Horizons Theater School and Club Thumb Workshop uh, staged the play uh, from September 7th through 11th, uh, 2015 at the Robert Mo Moss Theater on Lafayette Street. In November 2015, the play was the co-winner of the inaugural Relentless Award launched by the American Playwriting Foundation in honor of the memory of Philip Seymour Hoffman, which earned DeLapp a split of the $45,000 prize and a week-long production retreat in upstate New York. Workshopped for a full stage production at Vassar College as a New York stage and film production where the director, Neuge Bauer, an accomplished youth and scholastic soccer player herself, ran her cast through extensive soccer training for a fully staged production from July 21 to 30, 21st to the 31st, 2016 at the Powerhouse Theater in Poughkeepsie. The Wolves finally made its professional off-Broadway debut in a Playwrights Realm production at the Duke on 42nd at Times Square, running from August 29th to September 24th, 2016, and again from November 29th to December 29th, 2016. Ben Brantley gushed over the play in the September 11th, 2016 New York Times. And soon the Village Voice, Variety, New York, and other sources of theater criticism were joining in unanimous praise for the Wolves. With these accolades, the Lap began to imagine the possibility of the play being produced without her direct involvement. Quote, I'd love to see the Wolves in high schools, colleges, community theaters, all over the world, she told Brandon Stosey for the Creative Independent. You don't need much to do it just 10 women and some turf. Later that year, it was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. And then the production ran again at Lincoln Center's New House Theater from November 1 to January, November the 1st, 2017 to January 7, uh, 2018. And then the lapse wish for the play quickly became reality. Going viral, if it's okay to still use that term, on English language stages worldwide making its European debut at London's Theatre Royal Stratford East from the 24th of October to 17 November 2018. And then suddenly productions proliferated. This is not a complete or exhaustive list, um, but you can see um, how it just started to explode, uh, especially on university campuses uh, in 2018, especially 2019, uh, 2020. Um, Ryder College, if anybody knows, I think that performance was canceled. And then the Philadelphia Theater Company actually tried streaming it in 2020. And that was then done this year at Rowan, Emporia, Seton Hill, and probably some other places. There are no signs of letting up, with numerous productions scheduled for staging later this year. 
25 are licensed to be produced in the United States, and another four, Melbourne, London, Mexico City, and Tel Aviv, are licensed to be produced later this uh, year worldwide. So if the Wolves hasn't been uh, staged at your campus or, or in your local community, there's a safe bet that soon it will. An even safer bet, even better bet, is the next paper by Philip Wedge will examine this play too. Surely there haven't been many soccer plays, barely five years old, receiving attention with two presentations at the same SLA conference. The play is significant. What does it signify and how? Amidst this well-deserved hype, Rob McIntosh, a teacher at New York City's repertory company, High School for Theater Arts, decided to stage a production with his advanced acting class as a showcase for female students in the class of 2020. Given the demands for soccer technique, McIntosh posted a call for help on Facebook, answered by a high school friend of his, David Ziegler. Uh, Phil, you might appreciate this, a fellow Arsenal America board member. Uh, Ziegler suggested me. Having just finished a season coaching my daughter's 16 and under team for Sleepy Hollow FC, uh, that's her uh, right there. She graduates high school tomorrow. If positionality determines epistemology, I felt ideally suited for a dramaturgically or dramaturgical coaching role for the production. We quickly negotiated and scheduled six visits to help his student actors learn to play like soccer players. Aware as I was of the play's growing reputation, I must confess I missed attending any of the numerous local performances of the original production. So I ordered a copy of the script as published by Overlook in 2018, not the Samuel French acting edition. I would later uh, learn that director and actors were using and quickly became concerned over the script's demands for movement. Having adopted dynamic warm-up methods in 2006 as a coach, I was appalled at the very start of the play to see players static stretching in unison, with the exception of newcomer number 46, who learns their routine through the course of the play. No coach appears on stage in the play. Instead, number 25, players don't have names in the, in the play, they just have numbers. Number 25 assumes a leadership role, directing them through this pregame ritual which does include some dynamic actions in scene three. When she commands them to grapevine, I was lost as to what that might mean. Later that scene, number 46 intercepts a pass between players and begins to juggle. I was told the actor already assigned that role was the only member of the cast with any soccer playing experience. But how reliably could she execute this show of skill? Moments later in the, in the play, the sole player who threatens number 25's authority, number seven, gets five of her teammates to join her in a drill they call the spider web. Were the grapevine and spider web names for drills or activities I already knew, or were they something new to me? Week three dialogue dictates movement, but what specific movement does it intend, reference, or require? Any reader may easily imagine the lap soccer dramaturgy, but any staging of the wolves must incorporate movement or physical dramaturgy. For if the beautiful game is to be mimicked or represented with any sense of verisimilitude, it must be done as dance. I hope you don't find it unsporting of me that I decided to cheat and booked a once in a lifetime opportunity to watch a video at the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts Theater on Film and Tape Archive at Lincoln Center of the original production. Uh, uh, it was uh, filming of the 23rd of September 2016 performance at the Duke on 42nd Street. Under Neugebeyer's direction, the static warm warmup was complicated and elaborate. These are my notes that I took at the archive. The grapevine is what I'm used to calling karaoke. Number 46 did not juggle the ball in that production. Instead, she drags the ball back and forth from left foot to right foot with toe taps and drag backs. And the spider web is a technical passing, receiving, and movement activity, activity I had never seen before. It's complexity difficult to represent graphically, perhaps best done so from the perspective of the first player that begins the routine. So you see in this uh, uh, graphic that I made, uh, player 11 begins this with a pass, uh, across to number two, she runs out to the center of the circle, receives a pass, 
here uh, from player number 13, then passes the ball over to, to number 13. The line. You're frozen. Then needed to be made. Fidelity to the script does not necessarily mandate copying movements from another production, even if it is the original. Then I realized the question of what they do and how they do it is of course a question of staging, but the question of how they learned to do what they do and who they learned it from is itself the question concerning coaching, which may too often and all too easily do more harm than good. It is not simply a matter of opsis maisonsen. It is also a matter of dianoia, an essential thematic concern of the play. In week three, number seven questions not warming up properly. Quote, we're not going to stretch? No time, says 25. Um, hello, that is like so fucking dangerous. Number seven responds, and this changes number 25's mind, who then commands a quick pregame stretch. This seems like foreshadowing when number seven arrives for week four on crutches with a boot cast for a torn ACL. This provides an opportunity for number 46 to take number seven's role as striker and ultimately reveals herself as a diamond in the rough, which finally allows for her group acceptance. Number 14 blames number seven for skiing on a sprained ankle. But this of course begs the question if this is an example of overuse or a consequence of inappropriate preparation as number seven had feared. So, among female soccer players, were four to eight times as likely to suffer the injury as their male counterparts. U.S. youth soccer cautions against using the high knee technique in agility drills, precisely what number 25 demands with her opening words for week three, high knees. While her control and manipulation of number 14 results in tragic consequences, making her arguably the villain of the play, from this perspective, number seven is, at least physically, a victim of bad coaching. If the methods used in the original production are what I would not use coaching, even if I thought they were wrong to the point of potential physical harm, what should I teach or coach the cast? Avoiding what I view as improper coaching methodology would filter the play. Correcting what is incorrect would itself be incorrect. Although this is not a matter of submission to some sense of authorial intention. So as I taught the cast slash team the movements they would need to execute, I also told them how the methods differ from what I have learned and why I think they are wrong, beginning with our initial meeting at the school's black box where the play was rehearsed and performed. Rather than replicate the complex stretching technique routine, I implemented a simplified static stretching sequence I often use as a cool down. at the end of training. Although the actor playing number 46 wanted to juggle the ball on stage, it was clear it might easily cause a threat to the audience if she lost control. You can just imagine somebody juggling the ball, losing control and smack somebody in the face. Suddenly there's a lawsuit, right? Uh, the author's notes to the acting edition support this decision saying, quote, it ought to be an impressive show of ball handling skill. It was, only a reader of the play would think they had missed something. The school above town hall does not have athletic facilities. So we ran training twice in Central Park. Here I am with uh, some of the cast there. Although the entire cast could not make these after school rehearsals, they were effective for establishing muscle memory for the required movements and allowed us to scrimmage, which fostered a sense of team spirit, allowing us to shout, we are the wolves, as tourists watch. There you can see I'm actually showing them the high knees that US Youth Soccer says you really shouldn't do. The six meetings with the cast may not have been enough to make the team ready for a competition, but it was enough to make them ready for theatrical performance. In addition to movement dramaturgy, I helped the director with costuming and props, identifying a soccer supplier who, would, uh, who could provide appropriately numbered uniforms and balls, I also lent them additional equipment such as player bags, cones, and goalkeeper gloves. My offers of textual, uh, traditional textual dramaturgical help were surprisingly rejected by the cast. 
When I offered to explain, for instance, allusions to ECNL and ODP, uh, some of the alphabet soup of youth soccer organizations in America, the actor playing number seven simply said, that's okay, we just looked that stuff up. So I did not push the issue. They saw me or needed me as a coach, not a literature professor. While the Wolves might easily win any Bechtel test tournament, my own positionality drew me to consider three unseen characters who drive the plot. First, good old screamy, screamy coach Frank, father of the captain, number 25, whose leadership likely mimics that of her father. Then second of all, coach Neil, their current coach. Coach couldn't give a shit if we paid him, says number 14. Oh, that's right, we do, responds number seven. They accuse him of being hungover. They mock him for wearing sunglasses inside, for working at Best Buy, and even mock him for being a war veteran. Scrimmage and sports bras, they allude to. And one player says, our parents are paying out the ass for a coach. The third coach that um, is unseen is their beloved coach, Patrick. Who, who is their second coach, who replaced the father, parent volunteer, um, but he had to abandon the team to attend to his mother, who's struggling against cancer in Idaho, but comes back for week six to give a funeral speech for number 14. Two other unseen coaches are alluded to, a Texas A&M man in a suit who scouts players in the company of Coach Neal, and another team's Eastern European former pro coach, Mikael, who some players see as an object of desire, despite assumed wartime violence, in contrast to their current scorned coach, Neil, whom they imagine is guilty of wartime atrocities and who they think sees them as objects of desire. A team going from a volunteer parent coach to a sequence of paid coaches is a familiar pattern in youth soccer. Did Frank teach the girls their stretching ritual? Did Patrick teach them the spider web? Is Neil really a creep? By the way, that's the grapevine or what I'd call karaoke. Did Neil even need to teach them anything or did their parents hire him for his connections with college coaches who might offer them scholarships? According to the NCAA, only 7.2% of girls will make the transition from high school to college soccer with just 2.4 and 1.9 playing D1 and D2 respectively. And again, if they make it even on a squad, how much playing time do they get? And do they get any of the coveted scholarships that they're after? Perhaps that's Neil's greatest asset to the team, one that they're not really aware of. That the girls have only been coached by men is no surprise to anyone familiar with the US soccer landscape. As James Reed has shown, even with elite women's football, women comprise nearly 20% of the coaching at elite football. And according to the Aspen Institute's 2016 State of Play report, only 27% of youth coaches were female. And youth soccer ran last in US. Team FIFA report, women comprised just 7% of all licensed coaches worldwide. From AYSO courses I have instructed and US soccer co courses I have taken, frankly, those numbers seem inflated. Number 25 might well become a coach someday, but without proper training, she will simply mimic the negative methods of those who coached her. The Wolves powerfully depict the coaching crisis facing U.S. soccer. Here you see how untrained soccer coaches are. The production corresponded with a section of Honors English II and a section of Sport and Society that I was teaching spring 2020 here at Mercy College. Core theoretical principles from the latter were applicable for the former as I chose the Wolves to coincide with the School of Liberal Arts annual theme of voices. Students, all freshmen, so 17 and 18 year olds, all a year older than the actors and the characters in the play, read the play, then saw the production. Two concepts from sports sociology that were helpful for the college students as they read the play were socialization and the great sport myth. While each of the nine Wolves had their own individual arcs of character development, Week to week, as number 46 learns the team's warm up ritual, she assimilates into the group. But this comes at a cost. Initially, an unproven substitute, number 25 would not let her play striker as requested. Number seven's ACL injury opens the starting spot for her, while the death of number 14 unites her with the rest of the team in the bonds of grief. Scene six is a death mass 
at the Sportplex, organized by a text by Coach Frank. We are told by Soccer Mom, the mother of the deceased, number 14. As number 46 goes from outsider to insider, the play offers an interrogation of the great sport myth, which according to Jay Copley is the belief that, quote, sport is essentially pure and good, and its purity and goodness are transferred to anyone who plays, consumes, or sponsors sports. Therefore, there is no need to study and evaluate sports for the purpose of transforming or making them better because they are already what they should be, end quote. Just as the cast of urban aspiring actors were overwhelmingly unfamiliar with soccer, so too the college class of nine female and one male students had little, if any, playing experience or interest in the sport as fans. So I had the same number of female students in the class as there were uh, players in the play. I began discussion of the play by asking students to write answers to the following four questions. One, what do you think of soccer? Two, what do you think of girls who play soccer? Three, what do you think of people who play organized sport? And four, what do most Americans think of soccer? Read aloud, their responses set the tone for weeks of engagement with the play. One said, quote, my girls high school team was undefeated, capital letters undefeated, but received almost no recognition, end quote. While another said athletes, quote, are less likely to get caught in the wrong social crowd, end quote. This statement allowed me to introduce this concept of the great sport myth as we explored the wolves socialization. The nine female students attended the performance on Friday, January 31st. Uh, the, the male student in the class didn't show up at the train, didn't show up uh, in Midtown. Five wrote reviews of the performance, of the performance which was an optional uh, assignment. One had never even seen a play before. All found the play featuring readily identifiable characters and concerns with dialogue close to their own conversations. Fascinating. The Wolves has quickly risen to prominence on English language stages, a shockingly popular soccer play that addresses key concerns for sport and its representation in society. Thank you. Thank you, David. All right, so up next, 